Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Hello, everybody. Can folks hear me okay? So for those of you in the room with us today, thank you for being here. And for those of you online, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Bonnie Kellerman, class of 1972, and I'm a past president of Amida. And we have quite a few of Amida's past presidents here today. So could folks who have been president of Amida stand up and be recognized? So. <laughs> Um, some ground rules for those of you who are participating online. Um, you can use chat to send questions. Please send those questions to Julie Schwedock. And when we get to the Q&A period, um, Julie will let us know about online questions that we have. On behalf of Amita, I'd like to tell you about a few upcoming events that Amit is planning on April 26th. There's a virtual program, Create the Career and Life You Love with Selena Lee, class of 01, who is a globally recognized executive and career coach, lawyer, writer, and podcast host. And then on May 11th, there's another virtual program, Caring for Our Aging Parents with Paula Stone, class of 72, my class, and on June 11th, Amita will have their annual meeting with Marjorie Resnick as the keynote speaker, and she's fabulous. So you all wanna mark that on your calendar. But enough about other programs for tonight's program. I'm delighted to welcome you. This is the first in a series of presentations featuring women who came to MIT to hold the Ellen Swallow Richards professorship chair. And this year marks 150 years since Ellen Swallow graduated from MIT, the first woman to get an MIT degree. So we're very pleased to be sponsoring this series of talks from people who have held the chair in her name. The Ellen Swallow Riches Professorship was created with the purpose of increasing the number of tenured women faculty at MIT. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Susan Cannenberg, class of 61, who was a member of the AMITA board when this chair was first established. Susan? So this is, uh, I found this really very moving, um, but that happens when you're in my position, I guess. Um, let me get to the point here. Um, on behalf of the energetic amateur leaders in 1973, whose courage and commitment allowed the founding of the Ellen Swallow Richards Chair, and I want you to know that in 1973, it was a high flyer. Um, you'll hear from others in celebration of this 150th anniversary of Ellen Swallow's graduation and 50th anniversary of the establishment of the chair. Lots of old stuff. We have to remember what an unusual brave act the establishment of the chair was back in 1973. We celebrated in 1973, the centennial of Ellen Swallow's graduation. And at that time kicked off the campaign to fund the chair in her honor, a chair whose purpose was to bring senior women to MIT faculty. Professor Walter Rosenblith, then provost of MIT, whose eponymous chair is occupied by one of our own Ellen Swallow Richard professors, met with Marjorie Pierce, a leading donor to the chair and myself to discuss the steps needed to fill the chair. Professor Rosenbluth was dubious about the existence, the, even the existence of our intended candidates and wanted to fill the chair at home by an incumbent, which was contrary to its purpose to say the least. As Marjorie and I, so thus Marjorie and I had our challenge laid out for us right then. Concurrent with the kickoff campaign for the chair's funding in 73, Amita held a celebratory centennial event featuring exhibits, lectures, dinners, and cocktail parties. Our MC was President Jerry Wiesner, who managed the large convocation in Kresge. I should note that Amita first considered celebrating Ellen Swallow's admission to MIT 
a more fraught event in which tuition was waived by MIT so that if the experiment fell short, MIT could forget the benighted event altogether. Instead, as some feared, it only encouraged them. I just love it, I just love that. Nose under the tent theory, I suppose. But in 1971, there was absolutely no interest whatsoever and we tried. A situation that was cured by just two more years of waiting. Oh, and the women's movement. <laughs> Indeed, in 1973, the chair was established and fundraising began for this important goal to bring accomplished women to the faculty. Fundraising for a chair for a woman faculty member, think of it, was no barn burner and the slowly growing fund was a tempting target to many who couldn't abide an unused fund sitting there slowly growing. So MIT stepped up and found the means to complete the fund and we were off and running. Happy endings are great, aren't they? So um, having brought you up to date on a little bit of the background, I think it's time for our speaker, right? Thank you, Susan, for sharing some of that history with us. So our speaker tonight is Sarah Seeger, who is one of the women who came to MIT to hold the Ellen Swallow Richards chair. She is an astrophysicist and a professor of physics, a professor of planetary science, and a professor of aeronautics and astronautics at MIT, where she currently holds the class of 1941 professorship chair. She came to MIT in 2007 when she was awarded the Ellen Swallow Richards Professorship at that time. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in math and physics from the University of Toronto and a PhD in astronomy from Harvard. Her research has earned her a MacArthur Genius Grant and other accolades, including but not limited to membership in the US National Academy of Sciences the Sackler Prize in the Physical Sciences, the Magellanic Premium Medal, and she's been awarded one of Canada's highest civilian honors, appointment as an officer of the Order of Canada. I could probably spend the whole evening telling you about her wonderful accomplishments, but then we wouldn't have time to hear from her. She's been a pioneer in the vast and unknown world of exoplanets, planets that orbit stars other than the sun. And without further ado, I'd like to invite Professor Sarah Siga to talk about exoplanets, Venus, and the search for signs of life beyond Earth. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It was an honor to have held the Ellen Swallow Richards Professorship Chair. I'm going to tell you a bit more about how and why I came to MIT in 2007, but I'm also pleased to be the first speaker in this lecture series. So two, about three years ago, I was part of a very big discovery that shook the world of planetary science. This discovery was and is incredibly controversial and it's about the possible sign of life on another planet. It's about phosphine on Venus. And this discovery, it took a lot of guts, it took nerve, it took innovation. And that's my invitation to you today to innovate, we have to try new things. So let me take you on a journey of exploration. And this story actually starts not a few years ago, not in 2007 when I first came to MIT, but literally billions of years ago. When our uh, simple life form in our atmosphere, or on our planet rather, cyanobacteria, a simple single-celled organism, did something incredibly clever. I don't know about you, but when I think of bacteria, I think of them as being pretty dumb. <laughs> but they actually figured out how to harness energy from our environment, how to do photosynthesis. And in that process, they generated a waste gas, oxygen. So they use carbon dioxide and water and they make, like, they make uh, carbon compounds to store energy, but they give off oxygen. And that oxygen, it actually poisoned a lot of life around them. And eventually over a very long time accumulated in our atmosphere. So when you think of the night sky and all the stars out there, you know, they're all suns and all of them have planets. We think that every star has a planet. I love to think about an alien civilization with the kind of telescopes we're hoping to build looking back at Earth. And if they're watching us with big telescopes, 
they're going to suspect there's life on our planet. Not by, um, yeah, not by like pollution or city lights or anything like that, but really just by our atmosphere, by having oxygen, a gas so reactive, it shouldn't be in the atmosphere. So just hold on to that thought. If you haven't heard that before, astronomers first thought of it nearly a hundred years ago. We could find life elsewhere by looking for oxygen or another gas that is there in like quantities way out of equilibrium with the rest of the atmosphere. And that's what we're trying to do. And that's the kind of theme of my talk is how we're trying to find signs of life beyond earth. So this, um, we call it a biosignature gas. And I just thought you might like just have this little definition here of what it is. It's definitely um, a kind of checkered story. And I'm gonna tell you a bit about the controversy of phosphine on Venus a little bit later. But for now, how many of you have been to a truly dark sky? I was kind of hoping it was everybody. It looks like almost everybody, like so dark and you just see so many stars and you can't, think, can't count them all. Well, the next time you not even see that, but if you just go out and look at our night sky, it looks like it's cloudy tonight, but you can actually wonder what kind of planet is around that specific star. Because as far as we astronomers have been able to tell, we, it seems like most stars, if not all of them have planetary systems. And this new field just sort of sprung to life in the mid 1990s. And what happened was astronomers have thought there were always, thought there were planets because we see stars that are forming and they form with disks of gas and dust, leftover material that pretty much like it, ha it doesn't have to, but it's thought that it would naturally form planets. In the mid 1990s, the first reports of planets orbiting sun-like stars were first announced. That's when I was at Harvard studying uh, my, doing my PhD in astronomy. And my thesis advisor suggested I work on these new exoplanets. But at the time, it was really tough because we didn't see the planets directly. All we saw was actually the star moving. In fact, we only, not me, but the people who found them measured the line of sight motion of the star coming towards, going away, as one component of its wobble. So as to, a planet orbits a star because of gravity, the star is also moving. Like they're actually both orbiting their common center of mass. We just measured that little wobble. And astronomers had been trying to do this for a very long time, but they were looking for a Jupiter, a Jupiter. Like our Jupiter is very far from our star. It takes 12 years to orbit our star. So that wobble of the star would take 12 years. That's kind of a long time for a project. I think if you were starting a project now, 12 years, it's forever. But they did this actually. And people were publishing right before all the new planets were announced that there just aren't that many. Well, they didn't have a very large sample of stars. But now imagine an astronomer tells you, hey, we've not only found a planet, due to the star wobble, but it's in a four day period orbit. Translate that to distance. It's like seven times closer to its star than Mercury is to our sun. A Jupiter mass planet where from our observations, we don't see enough material close to the star to make a planet that massive. So this whole thing was very controversial. And my thesis advisor at the time, I was his very first grad student. So he didn't know you're not supposed to sign such a risky project because they might not have, what if it didn't pan out? You know, what if it was, people wanted to imagine it was a new type of stellar pulsation or something else. So, okay, time went by and a lot of the big places like MIT weren't working on exoplanets. But eventually, you know, a few, let's say um, a decade later, they had to start because all the students wanted to work on exoplanets. So MIT was looking around for someone who was, there weren't that many people <laughs> working on it and no one who was really, like at the right age. I don't know what the right age is, but I was in my mid thirties. You know, someone who you couldn't just be right out of school, but there weren't, there were like maybe two or three really senior people. So I already had had a job, I had a good job and I wasn't planning to leave that job, but they, you know, had been watching me for a few years and were like heavily recruiting me to come to MIT to start the whole field of exoplanets here at MIT. So I did come in 2007. I was the Ellen Swallow Richards chair for five years and here I am. So a lot happened in that time, but one of the biggest new things to happen is a brand new telescope we have in the sky called the James Webb Space Telescope. How many of you have heard of this telescope? And how many of you woke up early, um, not this past Christmas, but one Christmas before that morning at 7 a.m. to watch the rocket launch on TV? Yeah, a few people. Well, this telescope, it's really the key what we have for our very first chance ever to search for signs of life on exoplanets by way of a gas that doesn't belong. It's a really hard problem, but I just want to tell you a bit about the James Webb. Here is its mirror in contrast to Hubble Space Telescope's mirror. So it's effectively six and a half meter diameter mirror, Hubble's 2.4 meters. 
And that's one of its big assets is just much more collecting area. But the web is also in a very special orbit. You know, Earth is bad for astronomy. It's bright and it's hot. And the Hubble that orbits Earth, it's orbiting low Earth orbit. So it actually orbits Earth every 90 minutes. And it's going day, night, day, night. And what's bad about that is it's like heating up during the day when it can't be observing. And then it has like a 30 minute night where it is observing. But that heat like is making it expand a little bit and it makes it really hard for the kind of precise measurements we wanna do for exoplanets. So the Webb telescope is very far away. It's a million miles away. And it's orbiting at this really special place um, called the Earth Sun Lagrange point two. It's shown on this little diagram here. But essentially, you know how um, planets closer to the star go around faster by Kepler's third law. So in this orbit, it's further away from Earth. So it should be orbiting faster than Earth. But in fact, if it's lined up just so at the right place, the gravity from the sun and Earth slow it down just a tiny bit. So the telescope can be a million miles away, but still orbiting with Earth and always like nearly a fixed distance away from Earth. So we can communicate with it and it won't get like out of range. So it's a very cold, very dark environment with where it can continuously observe the night sky in the dark. And that's why it's so great. And the third point about why Webb is so good is it operates at infrared wavelengths. Hubble operated at visible wavelengths, like light we can see, but the infrared is where molecules are very active. So we wanna identify gases in an atmosphere of a planet far away, infrared is better than visible because molecules rotate and vibrate and just a lot more is going on in the infrared wavelength. Here's just a little poster summarizing those three points. Works in the infrared. Um, it orbits at this special orbit place and it's a much larger mirror. Just some pictures in case you haven't seen them. Okay, wait, I forgot to mention the web. It's just open because it's so big. You know, most telescopes, they're covered by like this barrel, right? But it's, no, it's too big. So instead to block out the sunlight, which would not only heat it up, but also scatter, like enter the mirror, Webb has this giant telescope, uh, this uh, giant tennis court size sun shield. And it's made of these five layers and each layer has a different woven pattern. So when energy gets absorbed, it wouldn't just be passed on, but it will radiate in a different direction and then get absorbed and radiate in a different direction and so on and so on and so on. I was lucky I got to see the web in all its phases, including like a very early, oddly enough, um, if you're an engineer, you know you want to build things and touch things and look at them, but they literally built a cardboard model of the um, main part where all the instruments go just to see that the instruments and wires would actually all fit like they were designed to. And I've seen like smaller portions of this, um, you, you know, they made like uh, one third scale, you know, versions of this, they heated it up, they did things to it. And this is, you know, one of the final um, images that made it out. So the web had to be all folded up because it didn't fit in like any normal rocket fairing unless it was folded and it was designed to be all folded. And this shows you it launching from earth and sort of a sequence of events that happened. This tennis court sized sun shield had to unfold. The mirror itself was folded. This giant boom came down where there was a secondary mirror and eventually it fully unfolded. It was like kind of scary for a lot of people who had a lot riding on this, but you know what? It actually works so perfectly and everything about it is just so awesome. And if you want to know a bit more about it, you can watch this movie called The Hunt for Planet B, where a documentary filmmaker, Nathaniel Kahn, he had a lot of footage. He got to go inside some of those clean rooms where usually they don't let people go unless you're working on it. And followed some people around, including me, and tried to get some of the story behind, like, why are we doing this? Why are we launching such a giant, expensive, complicated telescope? So I was only in the movie. I had nothing to do with actually making it. There is some footage of me here at MIT and one of our missions at MIT called TESS, the Planet Finder is in it as well. But I want to tell you that we uh, got nominated for an Emmy Award and we got to go to New York City last September. Okay, it's not the Hollywood Emmys where they go to Hollywood. It's not for entertainment. This is for news and documentaries. So it's a little more serious. So we all went there to support Nathaniel. He had um, some of the people who were in the movie. He had like the film crew, the sound crew, the people, the composer was there. And we got there just like, you know, MIT style, on time, or you say five minutes after the hour, we get there and there wasn't too crowded. I was like, huh, oh, that's weird. But as time went by, like the people who were super dressed up and really fancy fashionable clothes, they came later. And eventually it was so packed. So then it was time to go in the auditorium. And it's much like a graduation, if like a high school or university graduation, it kind of drags on actually. And you don't know what order you're in because they want everyone to stay. But when you're called up, there's five documentaries, five uh, per category. And they give a one minute clip and then they announce if you've won. So we're all waiting and we're all seated together until, yay, we won an Emmy in our category. 
So we go up there and there's Nathaniel, so happy. We got to hold the Emmy and like get a picture taken. But what's so funny that I want to share with you, look in the back how many Emmys there are. <laughs> this is backstage, because after you win and he, had to, he got to make a speech, we go backstage and what was so amazing, it's like, it really is top secret. Like no one knows, even the announcer, it's in an envelope, but they don't want anyone to know. So like, there's no names on them. They're just like so many Emmys just sitting there. Yeah, so there's Nathaniel Matt's, that's, that's the story of the web. That's like the past story. But what is web doing? Why is it so great for planets? Well, I have to just uh, explain to you what a transiting planet is. Out of all the planets in the night sky, around all the stars out there, some of them are gonna be lined up just so. So that the planet goes in front of the star as seen from your viewpoint. We call them transiting planets. Now, planets appear to be just orbited randomly. So if the planet's orbiting in the plane of the sky, you'll never see it transit. Just gonna orbit. But if it's orbiting this way, it will always, yeah, every time it orbits the star, it's going to go in front of the star. And what happens, there's a tiny drop in brightness every time the planet goes in front of the star. You can see the cartoon on the top, that's just an artist's conception. And on the bottom, that's um, the planet going in front of the star with this very, very characteristic shape. And that's just time in, in this case, it, it's just showing you time in hours and it's relative brightness. So by the way, I know it's MIT and you're all MIT alums. Maybe some of you are at MIT right now, but what this drop in brightness is, is just the area ratio between the planet and star. And pi r squared planet over pi r squared star. So that drop in brightness for Jupiter, in astronomy, by the way, we like to round everything. So we say, hey, you know, Jupiter is, is um, 10 times smaller than our sun. So area is squared, right? So it would be 100 times smaller than our sun in area. And yeah, look, the drop is uh, it's about 1%. So this is like a Jupiter-sized planet transiting a sun-sized star, could be anyway. So now I'm gonna give you something more complicated to chew on. So far, it's been fairly introductory, but this is key to how we're studying atmospheres on exoplanets. Okay. So do you see the artist's conception? They've drawn this giant fake inflated atmosphere. The atmosphere makes the planet a tiny bit bigger, just a little tiny bit, not as much as shown there. So I want you to imagine the planet going in front of the star and us observing the planet at a wavelength where the atmosphere is transparent, the atmosphere is not absorbing. Then the planet would be a certain size, right? The size of that dark disk. Now I want you to imagine we're observing at another wavelength where the atmosphere is very strongly absorbing. Now the planet looks a tiny bit bigger. Are you with me here? It's kind of complicated, but it is MIT. So, we're gonna look for the planet changing size as a function of wavelengths. So where the atmosphere is very strongly absorbing, the planet's gonna look a tiny bit bigger. Ready to try it out? We're now gonna see a transit that is taken with the James Webb Space Telescope of a hot inflated planet called WASP-39. Uh, and here you can see um, relative flux. So this is showing you planet, it's making about a 2% drop in brightness and it's showing you time from mid transit, now it's in days. So you're looking at these colors, which all represent a different wavelength. And that W in the top right corner, that's wavelength. So it's just scrolling through wavelength in microns, infrared, near infrared. And your job is to, oh, the black is like a best fit to the average. Your job is to look, does this transit look deeper? Meaning, does the planet look a tiny bit bigger at a certain wavelength? and watch the scroll a few times. It's just looping around. And your job is to try to see what wavelength, which wavelength. You can just shout it out if you can coordinate. Okay, four point something, 4.5, yeah. That's like amazing. I want you to just like think about this for a second. Wow, we can see the planet change in size or an area rather or transit depth because the atmosphere is very strongly absorbing at a specific wavelength. I'm really proud to tell you that I invented this method back in like 1999 or 2000. And that's what got MIT's attention. That's why I was on their radar. And even though now it's like the most used way we study exoplanet atmospheres, um, I'm not sure if it was really enough. Well, it was obviously enough to get me here, but <laughs> <laughs> it was hard at the time. People didn't know how big it would be. You know, remember, we didn't even know they were real planet. We did, people didn't know if they were real planets. They thought it was a cute idea. When I first uh, put this out there, Another team used it two years later and made the first ever exoplanet discovery, but I still wasn't able to get a faculty job. People were like, oh, it's a one object, one method success. We'll never have many transiting planets. 
We have 4,000 transiting planets, <laughs> thousands of them. But this method is here to stay. So I'm really glad you could all see this and just, I hope, appreciate that it's incredible. This telescope is gonna do amazing things for us. And now I'm gonna change it around a bit. And now this plot is showing you the amount of light blocked. That was the drop in brightness. Remember, it was like around 2%. That's the average 2% from the planet itself. And each of these points is real data. You can see an error bar. The line is a kind of best fit model. You can see where the planet is very strongly absorbing because instead of blocking out 2.15%, it's blocking out 2.25%. And what was that wavelength you were saying? Four, 4.5, yeah. That's this giant, very, very strongly absorbing atmosphere at a very specific wavelength. And we identify that with carbon dioxide. So you have basically, for yourselves with your own eyes, seen that there's a planet with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Okay, so what does all this mean? And here's a more scientific plot. But this is now showing you transit depth, the same plot as a function of wavelength. And we're showing you um, the points with error bars. And the different curves are just like an atmosphere model with different gases, just kind of on their own. So for you, because you're going to say, how do we know it's carbon dioxide? We kind of compare it to a models or a library of molecules, basically. And at the bottom, it's showing you something called cross-section on a logarithmic scale, it's function of wavelength. But again, you can kind of by eye, look and see you know, which one matches most and you're supposed to like fall on this carbon dioxide. So what this planet is, it's WASP-39b. It's a giant hot planet, too hot for life. It's about 900 Kelvin kind of in its outer atmosphere. Other molecules have previously been detected on this planet. And carbon dioxide, it's not the dominant form of carbon, even though it's the strongest absorber. Think of it like a skunk smell, tiny amount, big signal. So this is maybe neither here nor there, but I, it's, you know, um, we get into the weeds of the details of what this means, why people care, but it's just a triumph for the whole field to have such great data and it's such a strong signal. What we really want to do is apply this method to small rocky planets, ones that we can hope to find signs of life. That's what I started out by talking about. Remember, I'm like, we want to find oxygen or other gases that might indicate life. So what we want to observe is an Earth-Sun type planet, like an Earth around a sun. And I'm showing you a real image of our sun. You can see some sunspots there. I've also put some numbers that the planet to star area ratio is about one part in 10,000. So remember we said for Jupiter, it's about 1%, which is a part in 100. But Earth is way smaller. It's a tiny, tiny amount. And the atmosphere, that increase of atmosphere size, it'll be more like one part in a million. We can't reach that with the Webb telescope. The precision's not good enough. The atmosphere, like the skin of an onion on an onion, too small. There's not enough change in planet size because the atmosphere is so tiny. Uh, there's a lot of other reasons why it's so hard. What we can observe is we can observe an Earth-sized planet around a really small star, a small red dwarf star. Can you see the fake planet up there? It's the same size planet I just copied and pasted. And look, look how much more area it takes out. So if we wanna go and look for a small planet transiting a small star, we're back to one in a hundred. And the atmosphere to star is about one part, in, that says one part in 10,000. So we're doing that because we can. And in the search for signs of life, we're thinking about these small planets transiting small stars. So let me explain what this might be like. Let me briefly try to take you on a, on a, um, like a virtual trip to a planet transiting a small star. So the artist drew this sun really large in the sky because these small stars, they give off very low energy. So a planet near the star to be the right temperature for life, a planet has to be much closer to its star than our earth is to our sun. So the star might be very big in the sky. It's a little too big. I do an undergrad class that's very mathematical with physics and we work out the numbers. The artist also made the artist's conception of the um, sky just being a different color. And you can see some different planets in that same system. What's really interesting about these planets, they're so close to the star that over time, probably tens or hundred million years, the planet and star, like they raise tides on each other, just like our moon and earth raise tides on each other. But what this causes the planet to do eventually is to go into its lowest energy state, which is where it will rotate one time for every time it orbits. Just like our moon shows the same face to earth at all times. We call it tidally locked, but it wants to just rotate one time for every time it orbits. What that means actually is one day, one rotation is equal to one year, one revolution. But what it really means if we could visit this planet is 
the sun or that star would be approximately in the same place in the sky at all times. So would you go to visit where it's always day? Well, if you're an astronomer, you'd go where it's always night. Or you could go where the sun is always setting, but you wouldn't call it sunset, right? Because it would never really go away. Also, one year would only be, remember, because of Kepler's third law, the closer the planet is to the star, the faster it orbits. So a year might only be 10 days. It's definitely a different place. I really hope there's life out there, you know, having that same conversation about, wow, imagine a planet like an Earth. Its day is not equal to its year, it rotates really fast. It would be really crazy. But, you know, on second thought, like visiting this planet might be a really bad idea because the stars give off a lot of flares. They give off giant high energy flares. So you couldn't just like always be attached to your phone because those high energy particles would destroy your electronics. What kind of sunscreen would you bring? But seriously, these flares are a real problem. Here's a picture of our sun actually giving off a flare and a so-called coronal mass ejection. Have any of you heard of the Carrington event? This event that occurred in, I wanna say it was the late 1840s or 1850s. Okay, if you haven't heard about it after the, your homework assignment is to later go and read about it, but don't, don't read about it now, okay? Mm -hmm. Read about it later. What happened was a British amateur astronomer called Carrington was studying sunspots and he noticed the sunspot brighten. And a day and a half later, our earth became electrified. People could see the Northern lights almost down to the equator. Supposedly here in Massachusetts, you could go outside at night and read like a newspaper by the Northern lights. They were so bright for a couple of days. We didn't have electricity, but there were telegraph op wires and some of those wires caught fire. People operating telegraphs could take the batteries out and it still worked. What happened? Well, the time, I just wanna say here, it's really cool that we didn't erase the board because they were talking about Maxwell's equations, which at the time they hadn't articulated yet. It wasn't actually written down. People didn't really understand electricity and magnetism. What happened was when these sunspots brightened, it was related to our sun having a flare and giving off part of itself called a coronal mass ejection. And part of our sun went hurtling to outer space and it hit earth. And that part of the sun had an embedded magnetic field, which hit our magnetic field and induced a current. Now, no one died, but I don't know, it sounded pretty scary to me. But why, why am I telling you this story? Because these red dwarf stars, they're very active. And one of our favorite ones called TRAPPIST-1, it was observed to give off 40, four zero flares in an 80 day period. And one of these flares appeared to be, cause we have to do a bit of um, extrapolating as energetic as our Carrington event. So imagine if we're living on this tidally locked planet on the day side and every 80 days, there's, and you're closer to the stars, so the chance of you being in the line of fire is higher every, I don't even if it was just once a year getting an event like that. I always imagine that it would be like, you know how sometimes here we have a snow day and MIT actually closes and you get the day off. I always imagine it being like that, that you won't get a snow day, but you'll get like this high energy particle day where you're told go to your basement and just stay there for two days. Well, there's this book called Aurora. So when you're done, if you like reading, you can go read the book. It's gonna become a movie supposedly. And that book actually tells the story of this happening again, like to us. The problem is now we do have a power grid. And it kind of walks you through like some of, you know, what might happen. So I you want to, we'll switch back to like a happier topic. And so I just wanted to give you like a little flavor of where we're at with web. And we do, it's not just all, you know, okay, so no one, no one died. But the problem is right now, I just wanted to leave you with like the very latest that you wouldn't get from, you know, on Google or on news. These flares and this activity of these red dwarf stars, it's causing a really big problem for us right now. Because remember how the background star, that's in our denominator, and we're just calling it pi r star squared? Mm -mm. Because now it's changing. The flux from that star is no longer uniform because there are star spots, lots of them. They're evolving with time. The star is rotating. So the problem is whether or not they're giving off flares, whether or not that's affecting the planet, the activity from the star itself is also causing like an apparent change in the star size, you know? And that is causing like our denominator to change. And now we have these, you know, the transit is changing, not necessarily just to the planet. And this is overwhelming what we think would be the atmosphere signal. So in all seriousness, we're trying to solve this problem, me included. Everyone has a different way. We want to model the star itself from first principles. That means like magnetohydrodynamics and convection and three-dimensional models of the star itself. 
which have shown, by the way, that a star spot, it's not just a cooler star like astronomers want to believe. It has its own wavelength dependent flux. Some people are just trying to work on it empirically because there are some stars where <laughs> the planet crosses a star spot. And so you can get information that way. So I want you to stay tuned on this whole story. That's the summary of this first part of my talk. We have the successful brand new telescope with unprecedented measurement precision at infrared wavelengths. The fact that you for yourself saw that planet change size as a function of wavelength was just remarkable. There's some number of planets transiting small stars that the web is scheduled to observe. But we have to solve the severe contamination problem from the small stars like brightness changing due to its activity. So let's just fast forward in our minds and imagine it's a few years later, maybe just, it's probably gonna take a few years. Not sure if this problem is fully solvable. Let's say we solve it, we're gonna look for a gas. What kind of gas would we look for? There's lots of gases out there, thousands of gases made by life. When you walk into a pine forest and smell the trees, that's, that's gases from life. If you're lazy and your fridge is full of mold, again, okay, it happens to everyone. You, know, you just sort of put off throwing out that, that food. That's, yeah, signs of life. Well, to make a long story short, we've been trying to think of what would be the best gas. And one of our favorites that popped out of like a giant study in chemoinformatics is this gas called phosphine. Anyone here heard of phosphine? So if you work on like environmental things or pesticides, you'll have heard of phosphine. It's very rare gas. It's a phosphorus atom with three hydrogen atoms. But here on earth, we have very little hydrogen. Um, phosphine, Phosphorus, we have a lot of oxygen. Phosphorus wants to go with oxygen atoms in the form of phosphate. So it's nothing that people normally hear about. It's actually only associated with life on Earth, although we don't know exactly how it's made. It turns out that it's found in wetlands, in oxygen-free environments, in animal guts, in Antarctica, over penguin colonies, over penguin poop. And it is found in labs, laboratories, like when people take bacterial cultures, they measure phosphine coming off of it in some cases. So this is a great gas, and my team was thinking about this for the future, for exoplanet atmospheres, when oddly enough, we heard that someone uh, thousands of miles away in the UK was also thinking about phosphine as a sign of life. And in this case, Professor Jane Greaves did something very bold, because one of our privileges as researchers is to take some small amount of our time, or larger, it depends how risk averse you are, or how, what of a risk taker you are. I like to think of it like the investment pie. You know, some fraction of that pie you're investing in something with like high risk, high payoff. So she decided to take, I guess, I don't know if it was small or large, she wanted to search for signs of life on Venus. And what's so remarkable about her story is she also came across phosphine. She found some papers that described what I just told you about where it's found. And she realized that phosphine, when it rotates, it's first excited state going from ground to first excited rotational energy state happens at radio frequencies. And she's a radio astronomer. So she proposed to use some radio telescope time to search for phosphine on Venus. Of course, it was rejected because it's just so out there. Crazy idea. But um, eventually she got time and she found a weak signal initially. And someone connected our two teams and she invited us to join to help with the next proposal and to help interpret the data. That's the James Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii on top. And at the bottom, it's Chile, Atacama Large Millimeter Array. So it's definitely crazy. I mean, one of these things about exoplanets is the line between what is mainstream research and what is considered crazy and laughable, that line is constantly shifting. So when exoplanets were first discovered, MIT wasn't hiring, no one was hiring in exoplanets. But later on, MIT had to catch up and that's why they wanted to recruit someone like me to come here and do exoplanets. So why is it crazy to think about life on Venus? Well, due to a massive carbon dioxide greenhouse atmosphere, the Venus surface is so hot. It's really too hot for any plausible solvent for life and probably too hot for life of any kind, 700 Kelvin. But just like here on earth, if you hike up the mountains, you get colder and gets colder and colder. So too on Venus. And about 50 kilometers, that's really high, 50 kilometers above the surface, the temperature is actually just right for life. And Venus is so, the atmosphere is so massive, the pressure is so high. It's like a hundred times higher than on earth, but up in the cloud layer, at 50 kilometers, it's actually about the same pressure here. So oddly enough, it's like the same pressure and temperature. And so that's why Carl Sagan was supposedly the first to promote this idea over half a century ago that maybe there's life in the clouds. And here on earth, there's life in our clouds. Bacteria gets swept up from the surface. It goes in the cloud droplets. People send balloons up with 
rods that capture, you know, life sticks to it, they bring it back down and they study it. So sounds pretty good, right? <laughs> well, it turns out the clouds are not made of water though. They're made of a nasty, horrible solvent called sulfuric acid. The scene, you, I got you to laugh because I was telling you that the line is shifting. So hopefully a bit later, I, <laughs> maybe not this time, but maybe next time I can make you not laugh at this because it is, it's absolutely mind blowing where this, where this is going. And I'll get to that shortly. The problem is that even though there is water, it's locked away, it's hydrogen bonded to sulfuric acid. So it's like, oh, you couldn't separate it. The droplets are thought to be anywhere from a couple to like 25% by weight water, but it's like hydrogen bonded to sulfuric acid. So it's, we say low water activity because you can't get, get at the water. And this acid is bad. Anyone here ever worked with sulfuric acid? Okay. So I bet you have like big gloves and like, I bet you spilled it and seen what it does to your clothes or the surrounding. Have you ever spilled it on your skin? Okay, good. So you, well, I mean, I'm not saying that you have good safety practices because yeah, you don't want to do that. <laughs> so. Um, let me just tell you why, just for the people who are, I have this little video of sulfuric acid and sugar. It doesn't have sound, but I'll, I'll walk you through it. Oh, sorry. start by filling a glass. Oh, it's just too loud. What this scientist is doing is he's showing you sugar. Part of our DNA is a sugar molecule. So you're supposed to think of like our life and sugar. He's pouring this flask of sulfuric acid into the sugar. So what's going to happen here? See, it's starting to react. It's like bubbling. He's stirring it. And it's going to just start heating up rapidly heating. It's turning so black and so dark. It's nasty. It's a big mess. And over time, <laughs> let's see if this video does it for us. Uh, this heat and this reaction, see it's giving off that steam. It's literally just, the water is literally just getting sucked away by that sulfuric acid. That's really what's happening. This is getting dehydrated and you're just left with this black carbon. So that's kind of showing you why people think it's so crazy to search for life on Venus because our DNA, if you ever put a life form in sulfuric acid, that it's not, not pretty. So back to this. Okay, long story short, Professor Jane Greaves and I was, my team got to be part of her team, actually made an announcement. Did anyone, um, was anyone around at that time or heard it? It was during the pandemic, November, 2020. So we made this announcement that we found signs of phosphine on Venus. And just like earth, there's very little hydrogen Phosphine is incredibly thermodynamically disfavored. It doesn't just kind of lie around or get formed. It is really very um, hard to make. And we wrote like a hundred pages on all the different ways phosphine could be made. Volcanoes, lightning, meteoric delivery, lots of ways it could, but all of these fell short by sometimes orders of magnitude compared to the even very tiny amounts of parts per billion of phosphine we were claiming. Now this got very controversial for a huge number of reasons. One is that the data, um, was, you know, it's kind of crazy, but Venus is so bright in our night sky right now, but it's also for our large telescope facilities like ALMA, they weren't designed to look at really bright objects. They're designed to look at really faint things. And Venus is spatially resolved, so that was a bit of a problem. And there's just a lot of noise in the data. Just like our future for exoplanets, think about like a tiny signal and really noisy data. And you know, the more you have to analyze noisy data, the kind of more suspect it might be. And our data and astronomy is all made public eventually. So some astronomers analyzed the data with their own tools and did not recover the phosphine signal. Others did recover the phosphine signal, but wanted to attribute it to another gas, sulfur dioxide. And there were just a lot of reasons. It's kind of ongoing. And it's a bit like another story, methane on Mars, that was first discovered maybe 20 years ago by ground-based telescopes here on Earth, that some people still don't believe, even though it's been seen many times now, including by a rover on Mars. So just say science is working. I didn't come to talk about phosphine. I told, came to talk about a few other things, which mostly I think it's just gonna be um, verbal, but I was telling you why people don't like uh, this idea of phosphine. And I, I do want to try to summarize some science I've been doing related to Venus because it is literally just shocking. So there's this paradigm now that, okay, that sulfuric acid is terrible for any life, our life anyway in any molecule. But um, I, after this phosphine thing, I brought a team of people together to study what would it take to go to Venus? What kind of missions would we wanna to send to Venus to search for signs of life or even life itself? This topic is too taboo for like large government agencies. So we got some money, we started studying and a really clever thing of our sponsor wanted us to do laboratory experiments to help support the mission. So we found these colleagues and got them to do some experiments 
And there were two separate things that may end up being related in the future. One of them is that these one set of colleagues, Steve Benner and Jan Spacek in Florida, they seeded sulfuric acid with small organic molecules like formaldehyde, later on even carbon monoxide. And you know what? It actually evolved into a rich organic chemistry. And this is like, wow, what's going on? Well, they dug around in the literature and believe this or not, but like another industry already knows that you can have a rich organic chemistry, the oil refinement industry who use concentrated sulfuric acid to refine crude oil to more sophisticated products. Another one of our colleagues who was at Harvard, his name's Daniel Dusevich, works under Jock Shostak, they're now in Chicago. We asked them to, they're trying to make life on earth, like they're trying to create artificial life, like earth's life in the lab. And we asked them to take that, my colleague Yanush Petkowski and Daniel, to choose two um, lipids, biological materials, and put them in sulfuric acid and showed that they actually form into a vesicle, like almost like a cell membrane. So not only stable in sulfuric acid, but they're forming an interesting structure. But this is just like the tip of the iceberg. I, I wish I could share all the almost like daily exciting things in my life related to chemical. I'm like becoming... I don't wanna say if I'm becoming an organic chemist yet because it's so new, like no one knows about this. But one of the great things about MIT, so if you come to MIT and say, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, um, people usually don't laugh at you. You know, if you have this like, hey, I'm studying these, I wanna study um, not the sugar in our DNA, but nucleic acids, like adenine, cytosine, you know, ACGT. I personally, my team studied those in sulfuric acid and they are all stable and way more things. So I want to study this. We uh, long story short, we, so why it's so great at MIT? So there's this shared chemistry facility called the Department of Chemistry um, Instrumentation Facility. And if you're at MIT, you can sign up, you have to pay, but you can sign up to get trained to use it actually. And they're very, very helpful. The people who work there, there's three people who work there to help you like learn how to use it and do your experiments. And I literally just came from there before I came here because it was like, I usually get here really early in the morning and I found the right time to go there. It's actually 8 a.m., just in case you ever need to use it, because all the things I've been running overnight, the lab people get there early and they clean it up. Um, but I was running behind and just found something interesting and solved a little problem. So I was going there in the afternoon, but then it's all clogged with all the students and postdocs. So I had to go there before I came here to make sure mine were actually queued to run tonight. One other thing I want to mention about Venus, sort of, it's kind of in the spirit too. Like you could, I want you to take this away too, whatever you work in or have an interest in. You know, are there mysteries from the past that were ignored? Is there like this paradigm that everyone accepts that could actually be wrong? Well, one of the things that we found, we as my extended team, that there are these anomalies in Venus's atmosphere where uh, it's just people, sh you know, in the 1970s, the former Soviet Union sent several probes to the Venus surface, including um, they sent two balloons to Venus that each lasted about 48 hours. And these balloons floated around and took data. NASA sent a mission to Venus, a probe that went through the atmosphere. But they found some really interesting things. They found tiny, tiny amounts of oxygen in the cloud layer. Not what we have 20% by volume, but more like parts per million. And the Soviet, former Soviet Union and NASA each found those with two totally different instruments and probes. But it was shelved because people couldn't, recon like, couldn't get their heads around. Why would there be? People, there's tentative ammonia discovered. There are other chemistry in the clouds like sulfur dioxide and water vapor being depleted. We wrote a paper on this and said, you know, we postulated that if there's life on Venus making ammonia gas, it kind of puts all the pieces of the puzzle together and you can explain away all these anomalies. So there's a lot of rich possibilities for Venus. And I think it's fair to say that we can thank the phosphine discovery for this, wherever the phosphine discovery lands. I stand by the discovery as part of the team but it really opened this whole new world on Venus and the search for life out there. So what can we do about this? Like we can speculate about it, we can do our NMR, we can do our organic chemistry and sulfuric acid, but we really wanna to go to Venus. So I'm really proud to tell you about my team's first mission to Venus. This is the first ever privately funded mission to Venus. We call ourselves the Morning Star Missions to Venus. And we're calling our first mission, the Rocket Lab Mission to Venus. Are you familiar with Rocket Lab? It's a company that operates out of New Zealand and America. Their niche is small rockets. And their CEO and founder, Peter Beck, he also really, really wanted to go to Venus. And they were making plans to launch a rocket and send a probe to Venus when we had an idea for science and science instrument to go to Venus. So we joined forces and we're now going to Venus. Well, it's really cheap, really small mission. 
it's like throwing, I just joke, it's like throwing a rocket Venus. So we're gonna throw, a rocket will launch, a cruise vehicle will pop out and will take a few months to get to Venus. It will drop a probe into the Venus atmosphere. That's this background cartoon. And this probe, it won't have a parachute. It'll just sink down fast. It'll spend about five minutes in the cloud. And the instrument we have, we call it a nephilometer, an auto fluorescence nephilometer, where it's gonna shine an ultraviolet laser through a window and it through two windows actually, one in a pressure vessel inside the probe and one through the probe. And it's gonna look for fluorescence whereby these organic molecules that are rings, the electrons are delocalized. They're shared amongst the carbon atoms or the atoms in the ring. And they will, um, they're much easier to excite than like an atom where the electron is more tightly bound. So if we see fluorescence, we know, wow, there's something in those droplets. We don't know what, it's not life necessarily, but it's a very strong indicator of organic molecules. We'll also look at the backscattered polarized radiation and use that information. Our instrument's being built by Daryl Baumgartner um, at Droplet Measurement Technology. We have uh, the flight instruments basically done. We actually have the prototype here at MIT now where my team and I were using it to exercise it and understand the data. So I do, I'm gonna run out of time because I want time for questions. Here's supposed to remind you of what fluorescence is. There's just some data. Here's what the instrument looks like, our badge. So as I get toward the end of my talk, I just wanted you to, I have a summary on Venus and I have a couple more slides, but I just wanted you to think about Venus for a moment. Um, the report of phosphine on Venus really helped spark like this whole new avenue of research. We're showing that sulfuric acid actually is really interesting in and of itself. The problem we have now though, is with this whole phosphine on Venus story, what's gonna happen when we come to report a sign of life on an exoplanet? People will ask, you know, is the signal real? If the signal's real, is it attributed to the right gas? If it's attributed to the right gas, is something other than life making it? And all of a sudden, this whole phosphine discovery and controversy, it really kind of shook this field up because we're gonna know a lot less about any exoplanet than we are about our sister planet, Venus. And that's just something for you to like take away and mull over. The story is not over, it's gonna keep unfolding. Not just phosphine, I mean, but how we're going to sort through all of these really complicated issues. Well, it's not just the James Webb Space Telescope, but we have other telescopes. There's the large, the giant Magellan Telescope. It's a 20 meter diameter telescope. We're at MIT hoping to become a part of this telescope. There are um, two other telescopes like it. There's a giant special mission called Starshade. If you go to the MIT museum, the new museum, you can learn more about Starshade there. Well, I'd like to summarize my talk with a few details. So exoplanets, thousands of planets are known to orbit nearby stars. We think that every star has a planetary system. I talked a lot about atmospheres and how we can observe them. If planet goes in front of the star, remember we're looking for the drop in brightness increasing at wavelengths where the atmosphere is strongly absorbing. This is a big field. I'd say maybe a hundred planets have been observed that way with the Hubble Space Telescope, but I tried to emphasize how we're in this new era the Webb Telescope is gonna unleash all kinds of very detailed atmosphere studies right now. And I gave you one example. About searching for signs of life on exoplanets, our first chance like ever in human history is with the Webb Telescope. But we had to switch from Earth's around suns to small planets transiting small stars. So those are the only signals that were accessible to us. So the outlook is it's a generations long search. We're excited here. I hope you are to be around for like the first generation doing this but it's likely gonna take many decades to unfold. And as an asterisk, I found myself swept up in Venus, but it's not just Venus, but there's many other opportunities in our own solar system to search for life. That concludes my talk. And I would just like to thank you for your attention. I wish you all clear skies and your own incredible journey. Answering questions in the room. Okay. Um, so, do we have someone with a microphone to the other aisle? Okay. 
questions. Thank you. Professor Seeger, um, the, on Earth, we, I think our life form started with sulfur and using sulfur as energy transfer, but it was at the bottom of our oceans. And of course, water and air are both liquids. Certainly they have a lot of different characteristics, but um, have you looked into um, deep ocean sulfur and, and carbon uh, chemistry at all? Has your team looked at some of that? We haven't looked at that yet, but it's definitely a good idea. Not everyone believes life originated at the bottom of the ocean. I personally am agnostic on, on the subject. Okay, um, I have a question from online from Tom Courtney. It says, what do you think of the Drake equation to estimate probability of intelligent life in the Milky Way? And do you have an estimated probability? The question, yeah, this, I do really like the Drake equation. As many of you know, Frank Drake was the giant in the field and started the whole search for extraterrestrial intelligence by listening out for radio signals. And he died about a year, year ago. So his equation was kind of less about predicting and more about illustrating the ingredients that go into the search for extraterrestrial intelligence you know, by these civilizations that may or may not be sending us radio signals. I do have my own version. I actually altered the Drake equation and revised it for this parallel search of looking for signs of life by way of gases that don't belong. I saw Frank Drake a number of times and I asked him once if he minded. It's sort of like ask after, he was good with it. But in mine, it's again, less predictive and more, you know, here are the elements that go into our chances of finding life. I mean, we need enough stars in our survey. We have to be able to observe, a, you know, a certain number of planets. We need to know how many planets there are in the so-called habitable zone of their host star. We need to have, like the Drake equation, we'll never know, like, how many planets host life. And out of all that life, how much of that life is generating a signature, a gas that can fill the atmosphere. I have, I have, there too. Hey, oh, wonderful talk. So a lot of models for the origins of life rel rely on condensation and hydrolysis or natural mechanisms for condensation and hydrolysis reactions like uh, tidal pools, the wet dry cycles that are known with tidal pools. So I guess my question is um, with the uh, potential of uh, uh, atmospheric origin of life with Venus, uh, do you or Steve have any uh, models for how that could happen uh, on, on Venus? No, no. We're just trying to show some interesting chemistry and sulfur gases to start with. But believe it or not, there is one obscure paper, which I don't have the reference off the top of my head, but I've referenced this paper that talks about life originating in a cloud. I mean, anyone can come up with any you know, theory, I guess, but cloud particles coming and going and such. You know, one idea for Venus is that there's still a debate about whether Venus, like Earth, was born with water oceans. Most people think yes, but recent models that involve three-dimensional atmosphere climate modeling show perhaps Venus was always too warm for that. We're not sure, but let's assume for a moment Venus did have water oceans. Some people say it could have had water oceans for most of its life until about 800 million years ago. Imagine if there was life in the ocean that as the oceans were boiling away and Venus went through like a runaway hot phase, perhaps life migrated to the clouds, just like we have life in our clouds and somehow adapted over those um, hundreds of millions of years. So we're not sure. Okay, these a uh, couple of my own questions. Um, one is, so I noticed when you were showing the data of um, the um, decrease in the light signal with the different wavelengths, and it got much noisier in the CO2. Is that because of weather or is that just inherent in the wavelength? That's a good question. Uh, it could be it could be the wavelength of the detector, or it could just be that as the signal gets smaller, there's just more noise. It's a good question that I don't know the answer to. And then I have another uh, question, which is, I was just wondering, what keeps the dust off of the James Webb telescope out in space? Like, because I like, I assume that over time, if it would get dusty from space dust, the signal would degrade. That's a good question. Well, there are a lot of micrometeorites in space and switching topics for a second. One of the mirrors got hit by one early on and people panicked because if you know, sometimes if something happens immediately, it's going to happen often, you know, or like the first time you see 
that's always reminds me it's a bit off topic but when you see that one cockroach in your house like you know there's a lot more so they they try to stay out of the dust stream and not point towards it now so i mean stuff does degrade over time but i don't know if it's um i don't know if it's really going to get coated with too much dust for one thing you ask such great questions i mean i literally have to take these away in case i get asked them again so i have a better answer <laughs> But I do know something else though. I know here on earth, like we have to clean our mirrors on our telescopes or you like re and they can be like surprisingly dusty and still work really well. So first of all, I think it's not a huge problem. And the telescope does have, you know, it does have like an aim for lifetime under which everything will be fine. And there's also a question back there as well. Uh the limitation right now is the area of the uh, exoplanet transiting the, uh, the, uh, the star. Do you have uh, hopes that in a somewhat not too far distant future, the techniques will be better to allow you to go to, to a larger, uh, you know, a bigger difference between the ratios? We may, like the current method, like, these space telescopes, by the way, they're about 30 years from concept to launch. So when the Webb telescope was first thought of, we didn't know we would be using it for transits. So the flip side of that is we're using what we have. So our ideal technology to solve this problem is not the planet going in front of the star and looking for you know, the tiny signal backlit by the star. It's a whole other type of telescope. I have a second really quick one. You had two artists renditions of future telescopes. Do you have any idea when those are likely to, act, to exist? Yes. Um, I really do want to talk about Starshade. We're kind of running out of time. It's my favorite concept like ever. I'll just tell you what it is briefly. This giant Magellan telescope, it's being built now and the European large telescope is being built. So probably towards the end of this decade, these will come online. Their first instruments may not be able to find planets, but so you could say 15 years. I'll just briefly tell you about Starshade while we're waiting for the next question. Starshade would be a giant specially shaped screen. It would like be stowed and could launch together with a telescope. And this unusual shape, these petals would unfurl from a stowed position and expand and latch into place. This whole Starshade would be tens of meters in diameter. It would have its own spacecraft. It would formation fly with a space telescope. And the Starshade would be blocking out the light of a sunlight star directly so we could find any planets around it that don't have to be transiting. They could be orbiting in any way and this would work for some like stars. Mm -hmm. And Starshade is an idea that was conceived of in the 1960s and every decade since has been brought back to life. Until about 2013, that's me and some teammates, I got to lead an effort to kind of make it real. And I encourage you to go to the MIT museum and see we have a real pedal from NASA JPL at the museum. And you can read, learn more about Starshade. But there are all sorts of ideas, this whole star shade and this idea of blocking out the star so we can see the planet directly called direct imaging. That's like a whole field in and of itself. And that would be like our next generation space telescope with star shade or without a star shade. We can have like a chronograph, a kind of star shade on the inside of the telescope, but some light blocking technique would really be the way to go if we would really be the way to go in the future. Right. I have a, a question from uh, online from D Coles. Uh, does the shape of a transit dip depend on the orientation of the plane of orbit relative to the line of sight between telescope and target star? Does the shape of the transit depend on the, the orientation, orientation no. of the plane of orbit relative to the line of sight between the telescope and target star? Oh, yes, actually. Because the planet, you know, can cross the middle of the star or can cross the bottom of the star. And that may be a bit of a stretch like at this late hour, but it just affects like the wings, like how fast that planet appears to cross the limb of the star. So yes, it does. So there's a lot of information contained in a transit, including information about, uh, yeah, the orbit. Thank you. Um, I was curious, Actually, something you said, which was that your idea was thought cute, uh, made me immediately think that because you were a woman at the astrophysical lab in the 90s, that it might have been termed that way. It, it's hard to know what factors happened that way. But it made me wonder 
uh, what how how your team is is constructed? Whether it's is it half women who are studying with you? Is it um, I don't know. And how how does that team team work? Um, we as women scientists are we uh, and engineers are we um, equal and similar partners, or do we do you find that there are different insights depending upon how your team is made up? I'm not a sociologist, unfortunately, and I do struggle to understand people's you know, behavior and actions. I will say what I do find though, and this may not answer your question directly, is that the women tend to flock to women. So I'd say I have about half women on my team and it's probably because I'm also a woman. Oh, wait, there is one more. All right, another online question from Kay. Um, is, is the starshade really being built? Is the starshade really being built? Well, okay, can I be sarcastic? Does this look real? Because this is real. Well, the starshade, um, it was conceived in the 1960s and every decade it has been revived. We were so close to making it real. We had, we have this, in NASA speak, technology readiness level. Nine means it's flown maybe more than once and works in space. Six means it's been tested in flight-like environments altogether. Five means each individual subsystem is tested in a way that would work in space. We're almost at TRL-5 for every part of Starshade, which is huge in terms of being built. But we're having some like political problems at the moment, which is just the story of every big astronomy project. Like astronomy is a luxury job. We don't need it for our society. So we're sort of biding our time and having to strategize to get it built eventually. But it's until recently been as real as can be. So are there any more questions either from the audience or online? You have another online question. Another online question, is there phosphine on Mars? Uh, and that's from Kirpal Khalsa. Great question. I don't think phosphine has been found on Mars, but I'm not sure if people have looked very hard. <laughs> Any additional questions? Thank you very much for the presentation. So um, it seemed from all of your projects that there's a lot of stakeholders involved, whether it's private companies, whether it's chemists, astronomers, um, artists. So how does it feel to work on such like a inherent multidisciplinary environment? And for you, how do you find the line between an idea that's just insane or an idea that's insanely cool? That's such a great question. Um, the interdisciplinary thing, I've just always been interested in a lot of things, but I do take a lot of time. Like I've had to learn chemistry, even starting like at the level of a Khan Academy video and like working my way up. The nice thing about being a professor, I always think of, you know what, sometimes you may or may not think this is sort of nice to be an adult, <laughs> you know, you can do your own thing. Well, the nice thing is I don't have to learn everything and take every test. I'm sort of a very directed learner, so I can pick and choose what I want to learn instead of, you know, sitting through the entire class. So for interdisciplinary, that's important. It can be really hard to talk to other people because they don't see the value in what you do or their intuition is very different. So trying to find a team of people who can work together and speak the same language is also really hard. For Way Cool, um, over the years, I just, I, I'm one of those people I really trust my instinct. You know, the analogy I give, hopefully you've never been there, but I grew up somewhere that was a bit shady and we had like these back alleys. Every house had like a back alley. You kind of knew like, could you take a shortcut or is it like not really the right time? Cause it's kind of creepy. Like you use your instinct for that, you know? But in science, you can also have an instinct and it's actually something you can hone over time. So I like to think, okay, so sometimes honestly, I, I might've said like a year ago, I don't know if I'm in a wild goose chase or if it's the best thing ever. But right now, um, as time goes by and more of this chemistry is unfolding, I do think it's the best thing ever. And so I trust my gut to tell the difference between laughable and seriously cool. Another online question. Actually, we have, we have a couple more. Um, this one's from Caitlin Gunn and says, what's next if you determine whether or not there's phosphine or life on Venus? Well, it's gonna take so long to determine if there's life on Venus. You know, we can go there and find an intriguing signal from our first mission. A few years from now, we can launch another mission. Ultimately, it's kind of a trend in people's big thinking now. It's sample return. Uh, any fans of Mars know that we're planning for a Mars sample return. We'd love to go to Venus and collect part of that atmosphere and bring it back. And I had a NASA grant to study that idea. And we'd like to bring that back to Earth. 
So it will be a long time before we do find life, but it's something that we hope more people will get involved with to keep it going. And I have another online question from Bruce Allen Hecht. Um, thanks to Professor Seeger for an amazing talk. Question, with the renewed human spaceflight programs, thoughts on expeditions to the moon and maybe to Mars, and how about to Venus? Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, we got some laughs. There's actually a group that you may um, hear about soon called Humans to Venus. And some people love the idea. I mean, well, first of all, would anyone here, given the chance, go to the moon? Okay, we got a good number. How about Mars? Venus? So the humans to Venus, people, the reason why they promote it, okay, it sounds laughable to you, but you're gonna go to Mars and live in a cave and it's gonna be hard to, you know, you'll walk around, but people like this idea of Venus, you know why? Because the surface gravity is so similar. And so you can imagine floating around in like a balloon type of hotel in the atmosphere and the gravity and everything's the same. So I don't know where that idea is going. You know, some people talk about flybys of Venus. So it won't be me going I'm to outer space, but maybe someday people, tourists will swing by. One more question. So with uh, a lot of these human missions to other planets in the solar system, not to mention all the uh, unmanned uh, uh, probes, do you worry about contamination? Um, I know there are a lot of people working on that and, and try to be real careful about not contaminating other planets, but um, is that something you worry about? It's definitely something people worry about contaminating other planets, not just humans, but you know, bacteria is everywhere, right? And it gets on the outside of space vehicles. NASA has a planetary protection office where they have guidelines to follow about how clean you make things. We're worried about that. In the case of Venus and search for life, we're not really worried because you know our life can't survive. Remember, our DNA is partly made up of a sugar and we saw what happened to the sugar. So I'm not so worried about contaminating Venus there, but definitely, we're definitely worried about contamination. You know, Even for our own mission right now, we don't want to find a fluorescent signal and have that be something that came from ablation off our heat shield or that we brought. Any last questions? Going once? going twice. Okay, well, I would like to most sincerely thank you, Professor Seeger, for joining us tonight. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of the entire MIT community that we're very glad that you came to MIT. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. And And thanks to all of you for joining us in the first of what will be a series of events celebrating 150 years since Ellen Swallow Richards graduated from MIT. Have a good evening and again, thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.